Hi there. Today we're going to be talking about psychological research. Um, so you're assigned um, to watch the video by Adam Grant. We'll be watching it together here as well, but please just make sure to watch it uh, for your journal as well. Um, and now we'll begin. So the goals of psychology are to describe, to explain, to predict, and to control. And when we talk about describe, this is when we're reporting what we observe. So what a child eats or doesn't eat, behaviors or skills. And this sounds much easier than it is. Uh, when we describe, we have to make sure that we're not adding in any of our own personal thoughts or opinions about it. So someone may say when they, I've seen this many times when someone is describing a child, they'll say, oh, the child was, um, was not playing nicely. The child was angry. The child um, was, uh, was playing nicely. What does that mean? So what we really are looking for, what are the actual behaviors that make up what that description was? So was the child handing a toy to a fellow um, classmate? Was the child eating all of their food and um, finishing their plate? Uh, was the child leaving one item on the plate without eating it? These are the sorts of things that are descriptions. So this is where we're reporting what we observe. And our observation is something that should be very clear, not a description of what we think about the person or um, any, any kind of additional information. We're just looking for the observation. The next thing is to explain. And this is or to organize and make sense of the observations. So this is where we're actually taking all of the observations and we may say, well, uh, I saw the child uh, eat off of his plate and each time he left the broccoli. Um, at this point, you can make, uh, you can explain that you have seen this observation and you've noticed that the child repeatedly left the broccoli and you can organize and try to make sense of that by saying maybe that you think that the child does not like broccoli. Um, the next is to, is to predict. Predicting a behavior based on observed patterns, for example, if several siblings in a family are picky eaters, we might predict at least one parent as a picky eater or the new baby brother or sister will be a picky eater. So we can make predictions. And finally, to control. This is using research findings to shape or control behavior. So now that we have the goals of psychology, which let me just say it again, to describe, to explain, to predict and to control. Now that we have those down, let's move on. There are two types of research in psychology. There's applied and basic. So let's break these down. Applied research focuses on changing behaviors and outcomes that often lead to real world outcomes. I'm an applied developmental psychologist and my research looks to change how we view aging. So this is a way that we're gonna to look to have our research make a change in the real world. Um, basic research, on the other hand, is conducted in a lab and data are collected to refute or support a hypothesis or theory. And the purpose of this research is to gain knowledge, not to find solutions to problems. This knowledge is important though, for moving the field along by building upon knowledge. So basic research is used to build knowledge and applied research is to make a change in the real world. 
The scientific method is something that you're going to need to know, but I'll tell you right now, you all have been hearing about the scientific method in everyday life, um, but we, uh, we never quite realize it. We hear the terms and then we say, oh, I'm not quite sure what that is, but I'll tell you that in fact, um, you probably already really know this pretty well, um, but you just haven't realized it. And I'll be showing you what I mean about that a little later. So when we talk about the scientific method, this is the process used to conduct research. And the goal is to provide empirical evidence or data from systematic observations or experiments. So here are the five steps of the scientific method. One, develop a question. Observe something interesting in the environment, and then you form a research question. Two, develop a hypothesis. This is the statement used to predict the outcomes. The data collected will either support or refute the hypothesis. Sometimes people get one and two mixed up with the question and hypothesis, thinking that they're the same thing. But let's just back up to that again. Developing a question is when you are out observing something in the environment or in the world, and then you form a research question. You go out and you say, hey, that doesn't quite make sense to me. I'd like to study that and see uh, you know, if what is happening is really true or I, I just want to see what will come of this. Developing a hypothesis is when we um, use a statement to predict an outcome. This is where we'll say, I think that if, uh, uh, if I uh, present a depression scale to um, individuals in a nursing home that we'll find that, I don't know, um, 10% or more will uh, suffer from depression. This is something where we could say that uh, we have a hypothesis. Third is design a study and do the data collection. So this is where we're figuring out what the study will be and then we're gonna collect the data. So if I were to say, I think that you know, in a nursing home, about 10% of the individuals will suffer from depression, I will need to say, well, how do I do that? I'll have to say, I need to give everyone um, a questionnaire, uh, you know, to screen for depression, and then I'll have to collect all that and analyze it and then have them see a psychologist or a psychiatrist to have them, uh, to check them to see if they might be depressed. Um, and then we analyze the data. This is the next one, number four. We use statistical methods to make sense of the data. So after we collect all of our questionnaires and all of our data, we're gonna enter it into a computer and we're gonna see what, is, what comes out of that. What um, kind of sense can we make of the data? And then finally, number five, we publish the findings. We submit the findings to a scholarly peer reviewed journal. So I'll give you an experiment, a, a, an example of, a, of the scientific method. I worked in a nursing home many years ago. And when I first entered uh, the nursing home, they were, they, I was told that there were very few people who were depressed in the nursing home. But when I went through the halls, I, I wasn't seeing exactly what they were saying. I was seeing people that looked sort of, um, uh, they were sleeping a lot or they were not engaged. Um, they, they just didn't seem to be people who were lively and full of life. And so I, I had a, that was where I said, huh, I'm looking, I'm observing, I'm looking around the environment and I'm developing a question. I'm saying, I think there might be more depressed people here in this nursing home <clears throat> and maybe other nurse, nursing homes, but at least in this one. And so my question was, might there be more depressed people in this nursing home than they think? So my hypothesis was that in fact, there were more depressed people in the nursing home than the nursing home was picking up with their standard tool for assessing for depression. So I designed a study where I gave a 
um, uh, questionnaire to every resident in the nursing home who was able to complete a self questionnaire it was just 15 items and uh, 15 yes no items and um, used a standardized tool to uh, assess um, a, a smaller cohort of those individuals to make sure that that assessment that I was giving out was a good assessment and we collected those data and then we put we did uh, statistical analyses on them to see what came out and in fact we found that our tool for measuring depression that I had administered um, picked up a lot of people who were depressed so the screener picked up an you know for an additional 44 percent of people were assessed that were not being assessed before it's not 44 percent of the nursing home but 44 percent um, more people were being assessed than before so we published those findings and in fact it was a very good thing that we did because we were able to make change in how depression was screened for and looked at in a nursing home. That is applied research, and that was how the scientific method uh, was used, and it all started from one question that I had. And so this happens all the time where people will have a question and they'll go right through the scientific method. So right now what I'd like to do is take a look at a TED Talk given by Adam Grant. In this video, he talks about um, organizational psychology. He doesn't talk about research, um, but what uh, psychology and the way that um, you might be thinking. He's just talking about organizational psychology and some of the work that's been done. But if you listen carefully, you're going to hear um, how the five steps of the scientific method are um, used in the research that he's doing. I don't know if it was intended for that, but that's in fact um, what uh, we're able to see in several parts of this, several points of this video. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share screen with you and uh, we'll watch this together. So just a minute while I share my screen. Seven years ago, a student came to me and asked me to invest in his company. He said, I'm working with three friends, and we're going to try to disrupt an industry by selling stuff online. And I said, okay, you guys spent the whole summer on this, right? No, we all took internships, just in case it doesn't work out. All right, but you're going to go in full time once you graduate. Not exactly. We've all lined up backup jobs. Six months go by. It's the day before the company launches, and there is still not a functioning website. You guys realize the entire company is a website. That's literally all it is. So I obviously declined to invest. And they ended up naming the company Warby Parker. They sell glasses online. They were recently recognized as the world's most innovative company and valued at over a billion dollars. And now my wife handles our investments. Why was I so wrong? To find out, I've been studying people that I come to call originals. Originals are nonconformists, people who not only have new ideas, but take action to champion them. They're people who stand out and speak up. Originals drive creativity and change in the world. They're the people you want to bet on, and they look nothing like I expected. I want to show you today three things I've learned about recognizing originals and becoming a little bit more like them. So, the first reason that I passed on Warby Parker was they were really slow getting off the ground. Now, you are all intimately familiar with the mind of a procrastinator. Well, I have a confession for you. I'm the opposite. I'm a procrastinator. Yes, that's an actual term. You know that panic you feel a few hours before a big deadline when you haven't done anything yet? I just feel that a few months ahead of time. 
So this started early. When I was a kid, I took Nintendo games very seriously. I would wake up at 5 a.m., start playing, and not stop until I had mastered them. Eventually it got so out of hand that a local newspaper came and did a story on the dark side of Nintendo, starring me. Since then, I've traded hair for teeth. But this served me well in college because I finished my senior thesis four months before the deadline. And I was proud of that. Until a few years ago, I had a student named Jihei who came to me and said, I have my most creative ideas when I'm procrastinating. And I was like, that's cute. Where are the four papers you owe me? <laughs> no, she was one of our most creative students. And as an organizational psychologist, this is the kind of idea that I test. So I challenged her to get some data. She goes into a bunch of companies. She has people to fill out surveys about how often they procrastinate. Then she gets their bosses to rate how creative and innovative they are. And sure enough, the procrastinators like me who rush in and do everything early are rated as less creative than people who procrastinate moderately. So I want to know what happens to the chronic procrastinators. She's like, I don't know. They didn't fill out my survey. <laughs> no. Here are our results. You actually do see that the people who wait till the last minute are so busy goofing off that they don't have any new ideas. And on the flip side, the people who race in are in such a frenzy of anxiety that they don't have original thoughts either. There's a sweet spot where originals seem to live. Why is this? Maybe original people just have bad work habits. Maybe procrastinating does not cause creativity. <laughs> to find out, we designed some experiments. We asked people to generate new business ideas. And then we get independent readers to evaluate how creative and useful they are. And some of them are asked to do the task right away. Others we randomly assigned to procrastinate by dangling Minesweeper in front of them for either five or 10 minutes. And sure enough, the moderate procrastinators are 16% more creative than the other two groups. Now, Minesweeper is awesome, but it's not the driver of the effect. Because so I had a little trouble stopping this, um, but I wanted you to um, take note that when he's talking about this, he talked about his conversation with Jihei. And if you go back over that, you're able to see where each of the five steps of the scientific method emerge. And the final part where it's publishing the results or, or talking about them, that's what he's doing when he's telling us about this. He's putting that out there. Um, so number five with publish the results, he's showing us those results. He showed you him the analyzing, analyzing the results with the chart that he had. Um, so when he was talking about original thinkers, um, he talked about that. Then when he talked about how they're going to design a study, this is the next time that you can take a look at the scientific method in the way that he's talking. But normally, when you hear someone speaking about how they did something, just like you did with him talking about uh, his conversation with Jihei um, and talking about original thinkers, you may not immediately um, put it together that you're hearing somebody talk about the scientific method but hopefully now you'll be able to do that. You'll be able to break it down into those five steps uh, that we um, talked about earlier. So let's continue on and see if you can follow along with each of the five steps. So um, just remember all five of the steps that are there and just try to apply it here um, to, to this next part. Because if you play the game first, before you learn about the task, there's no creativity boost. It's only when you're told that you're going to be working on this problem, and then you start procrastinating, but the task is still active in the back of your mind, that you start to incubate. Procrastination gives you time to consider divergent ideas, to think in nonlinear ways, to make unexpected leaps. So just as we were finishing these experiments, I was starting to write a book about originals. And I thought, this is the perfect time to teach myself to procrastinate. 
while writing a chapter on procrastination. So I met a procrastinator. And like any self-respecting procrastinator, I woke up early the next morning and I made a to-do list with steps on how to procrastinate. <laughs> and then I worked diligently toward my goal of not making progress toward my goal. I started writing the procrastination chapter and one day I was halfway through, I literally put it away in mid-sentence for months. It was agony. But when I came back to it, I had all sorts of new ideas. As Aaron Sorkin put it, you call it procrastinating, I call it thinking. And along the way, I discovered that a lot of great originals in history were procrastinators. Take Leonardo da Vinci. He toiled on and off for 16 years on the Mona Lisa. He felt like a failure. He wrote as much in his journal. But some of the diversions he took in optics transformed the way that he modeled light and made him into a much better painter. What about Martin Luther King Jr.? The night before the biggest speech of his life, the March on Washington, he was up past 3 a.m. rewriting it. He's sitting in the audience waiting for his turn to go on stage, and he is still scribbling notes and crossing out lines. When he gets on stage, 11 minutes in, he leaves his prepared remarks to utter four words that change the course of history. I have a dream. That was not in the script. By delaying the task of finalizing the speech until the very last minute, he left himself open to the widest range of possible ideas. And because the text wasn't set in stone, he had freedom to improvise. Procrastinating is a vice when it comes to productivity, but it can be a virtue for creativity. What you see with a lot of great originals is that they are quick to start, but they're slow to finish. And this is what I missed with Warby Parker. When they were dragging their heels for six months, I looked at them and said, you know, a lot of other companies are starting to sell glasses online. They missed the first mover advantage. But what I didn't realize was they were spending all that time trying to figure out how to get people to be comfortable ordering glasses online. And it turns out the first mover advantage is mostly a myth. Look at a classic study of over 50 product categories, comparing the first movers who created the market with the improvers who introduced something different and better. What you see is that the first movers had a failure rate of 47% compared with only 8% for the improvers. Look at Facebook, waiting to build a social network until after MySpace and Friendster. Look at Google, waiting for years after AltaVista and Yahoo. It's much easier to improve on somebody else's idea than it is to create something new from scratch. So the lesson I learned is that to be original, you don't have to be first. You just have to be different and better. But that wasn't the only reason I passed on Warby Parker. They were also full of doubts. They had backup plans lined up, and that made me doubt that they had the courage to be original. Because I expected that originals would look something like this. Now on the surface, a lot of original people look confident, but behind the scenes, they feel the same fear and doubt that the rest of us do. They just manage it differently. Let me show you. This is a depiction of how the creative process works for most of us. Now, in my research, I discovered there are two different kinds of doubt. There's self-doubt and idea doubt. Self-doubt is paralyzing. It leads you to freeze. But idea doubt is energizing. It motivates you to test, to experiment, to refine, just like MLK did. And so the key to being original is just a simple thing of avoiding the leap from step three to step four. Instead of saying, I'm crap, you say the first few drafts are always crap. And I'm just not there yet. So how do you get there? Well, there's a clue, it turns out, in the internet browser that you use. We can predict your job performance and your commitment just by knowing what web browser you use. Now, some of you are not going to like the results of this study. But there is good evidence that Firefox and Chrome users significantly outperform Internet Explorer and Safari users. Yes! also stay in their jobs 15% longer, by the way. Why? It's not a technical advantage. 
the four browser groups on average have similar typing speed and they also have similar levels of computer knowledge. It's about how you got the browser. Because if you use Internet Explorer or Safari, those came pre-installed on your computer and you accepted the default option that was handed to you. If you wanted Firefox or Chrome, you had to doubt the default and ask, is there a different option out there? And then be a little resourceful and download a new browser. So people hear about this study and they're like, great, if I want to get better at my job, I just need to upgrade my browser. No, it's about being the kind of person who takes the initiative to doubt the default and look for a better option. And if you do that well, you will open yourself up to the opposite of deja vu. There's a name for it. It's called Vujade. Vuja day is when you look at something you've seen many times before and all of a sudden see it with fresh eyes. It's a screenwriter who looks at a movie script that can't get the green light for more than half a century. In every past version, the main character has been an evil queen, but Jennifer Lee starts to question whether that makes sense. She rewrites the first act, reinvents the villain as a tortured hero, and Frozen becomes the most successful animated movie ever. So there's a simple message from this story. When you feel doubt, don't let it go. <laughs> what about fear? Originals feel fear too. They're afraid of failing. But what sets them apart from the rest of us is that they're even more afraid of failing to try. They know you can fail by starting a business that goes bankrupt or by failing to start a business at all. They know that in the long run, our biggest regrets are not our actions, but our inactions. The things we wish we could redo, if you look at the science, are the chances not taken. Elon Musk told me recently he didn't expect Tesla to succeed. He was sure the first few SpaceX launches would fail to make it to orbit, let alone get back. But it was too important not to try. And for so many of us, when we have an important idea, we don't bother to try. But I have some good news for you. You're not going to get judged on your bad ideas. A lot of people think they will. If you look across industries and ask people about their biggest idea, their most important suggestion, 85% of them stayed silent instead of speaking up. They're afraid of embarrassing themselves, of looking stupid. But guess what? Originals have lots and lots of bad ideas. Tons of them, in fact. Take the guy who invented this. Do you care that he came up with a talking doll so creepy that it scared not only kids but adults too? No, you celebrate Thomas Edison for pioneering the light bulb. If you look across fields, the greatest originals are the ones who fail the most because they're the ones who try the most. Take classical composers, the best of the best. Why do some of them get more pages in encyclopedias than others and also have their compositions re-recorded more times? One of the best predictors is the sheer volume of compositions that they generate. The more output you churn out, the more variety you get, and the better your chances of stumbling on something truly original. Even the three icons of classical music, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, had to generate hundreds and hundreds of compositions to come up with a much smaller number of masterpieces. Now, you may be wondering, how did this guy become great without doing a whole lot? I don't know how Wagner pulled that off. But for most of us, if we want to be more original, we have to generate more ideas. The Warby Parker founders, when they were trying to name their company, they needed something sophisticated, unique, with no negative associations to build a retail brand. And they tested over 2,000 possibilities before they finally put together Warby and Parker. So if you put all this together, what you see is that originals are not that different from the rest of us. They feel fear and doubt. They procrastinate. They have bad ideas. And sometimes it's not in spite of those qualities, but because of them, that they succeed. So when you see those things, don't make the same mistake I did. Don't write them off. And when that's you, don't count yourself out either. Know that being quick to start but slow to finish can boost your creativity. That you can motivate yourself by doubting your ideas and embracing the fear of failing to try. And that you need a lot of bad ideas in order to get a few good ones. Look, being original is not easy, but I have no doubt about this. It's the best way to improve the world around us. Thank you.
Okay, so, oops. Hold on. I'm just going to get out of this so it doesn't continue to play. Okay, great. So, um, to get back to Adam Grant's talk, the really, uh, you'll be looking at this again, uh, reviewing this again for uh, your assignment for your journal. Um, but I'd love it if you can take a look at it again and try to look for the scientific method in it. He does, um, it does get spelled out more than once. And take note that you can watch a video any, uh, by anyone and end up really learning about um, how they came up with their, uh, how they made a change, what they did. Oftentimes it's the scientific method that's being employed, but we, we don't think of it that way. We just think of it as this is the logical way that we do things. And so, um, like I said before, I have a feeling that you probably all already know and understand the scientific method really well. Um, and if you were following along with this and understood what he was talking about, um, then in fact, you do understand the scientific method. It's not more complex than that. So take a look at it again on your own um, and for your journal, go ahead and see if you can find uh, the scientific method in there. Um, <clears throat> so um, when we talk about the scientific method, um, this is the process that we use to conduct research. And you were able to see that in the video. That's how I did my research. Um, it's, it's the process that we all use to conduct research. And the goal is to provide empirical evidence or data from systematic observations or experiments. So um, let's go into detail about the five. Let's really um, talk a little bit more about it, go into a little more depth with it. Um, I just listed them out before, but let's dig in a little bit. Um, so when we develop a question, this is number one, uh, we observe something interesting in the environment and then we form the research question. Okay, so I talked about that with the nursing home. Uh, they talked about that with original thinkers. Um, we develop a hypothesis. This is the statement used to predict outcomes. The data collected will be used to support or refute the hypothesis. So when I went into the nursing home, my hypothesis was that if I use the GDS, which is a short form questionnaire to screen for depression, um, uh, this tool was different than the one that was used in the nursing home currently. I, my hypothesis was that I would find that there were more depressed individuals than the current um, assessment they were using was, would yield. So uh, number three, design the study and collect the data. So for this one, uh, we're designing our study. So as you got to listen to um, the way that the study was conducted in the video that we watched, that's one way. Um, the way that I did it uh, in the study that I did was um, I assessed all the residents with the GDS at the same time that their nursing home um, assessment was being conducted. And then I compared the two measures. I wanted to see if one was correct or not. And then I compared that to a diagnostic tool uh, that was considered to be the gold standard outside of the facility that everyone agreed on was a reliable diagnostic uh, tool for depression. So that was how I studied, uh, how I designed the study and the data that I collected were the screener screening tools, um, the screening measures and the diagnostic tools. Um, and I also collected the nursing homes uh, data to compare it as well. So I had all this data collected and then I had to analyze the data. That's number four, analyzing the data. I needed to use a statistical method 
to make sense of the data. And so did they in the video that, that we watched because we were able to see them showing the results of, the, uh, of what they found with their analysis. So in, in the case of the work that I did, the results showed that the GDS, the measure, the measure that I was using, had um, significant, uh, significantly similar, similar results to the gold standard diagnostic tool that everyone in the world was considering to be um, an accurate diagnostic tool for depression. But the nursing home uh, measure that was used across the country in all nursing homes did not have um, significantly similar, similar, similar results to the um, tool that, uh, the diagnostic tool that was used. So um, this showed that the tool that I used did a better job of identifying depressed residents in the nursing home uh, with a 44% increase in referrals than they had before. So uh, we did number five, which was publish the findings. And this is where you submit your findings to a scholarly peer-reviewed journal. Um, and the results that we uh, submitted were published. Um, and in the case of the work that um, uh, Adam Grant was showing, it was also, um, the findings were also published. And in fact, you were seeing the findings. He put them up there on the screen and he talked about it. So the process continues even after these steps are reached um, because the findings lead to more questions. Somebody will say, well, maybe I could do it better or is this it or is it correct? Um, so the whole process starts again. We never know all the answers as scientists and we're always in pursuit of learning more. So the scientific method gets employed over and over and over again. There are some really important research terms that you'll need to know. And these are terms that I'm gonna break down for you here. You can also find them in your textbook. Um, and uh, these are um, terms that you really should uh, try to master. So make sure to go over these terms. Um, the first one is variables. Variables are measurable characteristics that change or vary over time or across people. So you can see the word vary in variables and you all know what the word vary means. So let me say it again. Variables are measurable characteristics that change or vary over time or across people. So what might be examples of those? Things like temperature, right? That can change over time. You wake up in the morning and it's 50 degrees out. By noon, it might be 70 degrees, right? It can change over time. Um, volume, volume can change over time. Friendliness can change over time. Shyness, memory, mood, gender, SES. It can go on and on and on. Anything that can change or vary over time. Psychologists often look at relationships between variables. So does a sedentary person have a greater risk of dementia? Does a person who exercises every day have a better mood than someone who's sedentary? These are questions researchers ask and they're examples of variables uh, that they look at to see if there's a relationship between the two. The researcher knows the variable that he or she wants to study. Um, so let's move on. The next thing that you need to know about are uh, the participants in studies, right? So how do researchers uh, get the people for the studies that they're in? They need participants. So let's talk about this a little bit. Population. All members of an identified group a psychologist is interested in examining is the population. So a population is the overall group. That would be college students, people 65 and older, voters. All of these are populations. 
And a sample is when the population is really large, a smaller subgroup needs to be selected. So for example, a researcher couldn't possibly look at all the college students in the country. So they need to take a sample of that population. So you need to take um, some of the college students, a sampling of the college students from around the country. If you're looking at voters, you're not gonna be able to get every single voter. You take a sample of the population of voters. Now let's break it down a little more. There's random sample. So we talked about a sample that would be college students, that would be you know, uh, a sample of voters. Um, in a random sample, it's a subset of the population where each participant has an equal chance of being selected. So any in the, anyone in the population has an equal chance of being selected to participate in the study. So what could happen if a sample isn't randomly selected? You could end up with a study um, uh, of all the voters being Republicans, or if it's college students, all Ivy League or all community college or all state schools, it, you might end up not getting um, a good general um, look at what the population is. So random sampling is a way to um, uh, get a, a better sampling. If we break it down further, there's the representative sample. And this, for this, a sample must be representative of the population. So if you remember, we're starting with population and we're looking at samples. There's the sample, there's random sample, and now we're talking about representative sample. A sample must be representative of the population. So for example, if all of your sample of voters came from Nevada, you wouldn't have a representative sample of the United States. If all of your um, college students came from uh, SUNY Old Westbury, you would not have a representative example of college students across the country. You need to get a sample from many or all states or many or all schools to have a representative sample. So random is important, but it also needs to be representative. So you don't wanna just randomly sample college students only in New York or voters only in one state. You wanna get um, a representative sample that um, covers the whole country or all of the colleges. So now let's talk about descriptive and experimental research. In descriptive research, we're primarily describing, uh, this is where we're primarily describing, um, and it's used for exploring new ideas and topics, and there might not be specific outcomes expected. So descriptive research methods are used when the researcher wants to describe specific behaviors as it occurs in the environment. Traditionally, descriptive research involves three main categories, observation, case studies, and surveys. So if you have an interest in how toddlers from different cultures engage in play activities, you would watch from afar or maybe through a two-way mirror, um, simply observing and noting what you're seeing so you don't disturb their natural play and interfere. After you complete all of your observations, then you make your inferences. In this type of research, nothing is being manipulated. You're simply observing. So can you think of anything that could go wrong with observation? What might be an issue that could come up with observation? It seems pretty straightforward. You're just watching. Well, observe, observer bias is one. This is when we have errors in recording our observations. We know this happens in life. Two people see something and they both come away with a different interpretation. We see this in courtrooms when people describe something they observe. Uh, this happens in research too. And researchers 
have to be very careful with this. There are steps in place for observers. Two people observe and must keep track of specific behaviors. If there isn't at least around a 97% agreement, the coding is considered not usable. So when I'm talking about this, um, uh, uh, this is so that we don't make inferences based on our own biases. So let's just talk about an example. If you have kids that are, you're videotaping to see uh, if you're, you're looking at behaviors of, of young kids, maybe you want to see if they have help seeking behaviors or something like that. Uh, when they, when a problem arises, what do they do? Do they seek for, do they seek help or do they just give up? What happens? So let's say you have a help seeking study and you're behind a two way mirror looking at the kids um, and you're, you're checking off observable things. Yes, ask for help. Yes, ask for help. No, didn't ask for help. No, didn't ask for help. Um, quit, you know, whatever your observations are that you're looking at. So um, what you need to do is have at least two people who are there rating it. So whether you're both there live doing it at the same time or you videotape it and you sit in separate areas and you do the, um, you, do the coding together, you have to make sure that you're both seeing at least 97% agreement. Otherwise, it, 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 um, there's an observer bias there. We really need to have the near perfect agreement without speaking with the other person or knowing what they're writing in order to um, avoid observer bias. So one thing that we really have to take look, a look at with um, the case of observation is that we're not um, engaging in, in observer bias, that we're watching for that and we're controlling for that. Um, so observation is a great descriptive form of research, but we do have to make sure that we take note of any kind of observer bias that could step in with it. The next one to talk about is case study. So this is a detailed examination of an individual or a small group. And psychologists often present case studies of their patients. And you see this when they do grand rounds in the hospital. Somebody will go around and they'll talk about the patient to make sure that somebody, um, they'll talk about their, the particular case. And um, in research, a case study is a detailed examination of a participant. Um, uh, the same way that it would be a detailed um, examination of a patient in a hospital uh, that is uh, being presented at grand rounds. So case studies are isolated examples and cannot be used to support or refute a hypothesis. They're simply there, uh, simply used to gain knowledge. There's also a survey. And I mentioned a survey from the research that I did. Jihei in the video uh, talked about, or he talked about how Jihei used a survey. Um, and we've all, at one point or another, participated in a survey. Surveys are questionnaires to gather data. And there are so many of these on social media and all over the place. Um, problems can arise with surveys. Wording can be biased. Uh, res respondents might not answer truthfully. Um, it also only aims it really only skims the surface of an issue. You don't really get to know much about the issue that you're looking at beyond the answers. There's nothing in depth there. So the others that I, you know, the, the um, previous one that I talked about, the case study, that's really detailed and in depth and a survey is not. Um, we also have another issue that can arise with surveys and that is sending out surveys to a random sample and only a few people answer, then it might not be a ran random sample any longer. Uh, so that's another issue uh, that arises with surveys. Surveys though are quick and easy to do usually. It's a great way to collect data. Um, they're used a lot, but there are issues and we need to be aware of them. Correlation. Um, correlation uh, looks at the relationship between the variables. So it might be looking at consuming fatty foods and weight gain 
as one goes up, you eat more fatty foods, maybe weight gain goes up, right? So as one goes up, the other one goes up. This is a positive correlation. Increased exercise and weight loss is a negative correlation. As one goes up, the other one goes down. You can't infer cause from a correlation. All you can say is that there is a link. There could always be a third variable that results in the change. Think about this for a minute. What could that third variable be if you're doing exercise and having weight loss? What else could there be? Well, there could be an unaccounted for characteristic of the parent, of the participant. For example, with increased in weight loss, there may have been a contributing third variable of an illness like cancer, which is influencing the weight loss. So that's something that we have to keep in mind with correlation, that there could always be a third variable that's influencing it. Now let's take a look at our experimental research. This is a type of research that manipulates a variable, an independent variable, to uncover a cause and effect relationship. Every variable but those manipulated by the researcher are held constant. That means that they're not able to be manipulated. So the only effect that can be the, the only effect can be the independent variable. So one thing that you need to uh, keep in mind with this, I'll try to give you an example. Hopefully this will help. Uh, let's see, um, you're in Times Square and it's really, really crowded. Just imagine yourself, picture yourself in Times Square and it's really crowded. And you go there with your friend, you're there with your best friend. We'll name your best friend independent variable. So you and your friend get separated and it's hard to find your friend. But everyone suddenly gets frozen and only your friend can move around. It was super difficult to find your friend before when everybody was moving around and your friend was moving around. But as soon as everyone is frozen, it's easy to find your friend. Um, so the people who are um, frozen are held constant. Your friend is not. This is when it becomes easy to see your friend. Uh, and your friend is independent variable. Um, so hopefully this example will um, make it a little easier to remember, uh, remember that. So let's talk about random assignment. Um, this is critical for um, experimental research. Participants must be randomly assigned to groups, ensuring that everyone has had an equal chance to be in either group. So 100 participants are randomly assigned to one group and, a hun and uh, there's a control group. So they're assigned to either the, um, the experiment group or to the um, control group. So they get randomly assigned. If we're talking, let's say we're talking about a study to see if vitamin D um, helps people to get stronger. Uh, we would take 100 participants and assign them to the, um, half to the vitamin D group and half to the um, uh, control group. And we would see um, the, the control group would be one where they're given a sugar pill or a placebo. So that random assignment is key. We must have that in an experimental research study. The independent variable is the experimental um, method, the variable manipulated by the experimenter. In this case, vitamin D, it's the only thing that's changing. You either get it or you don't. The dependent variable is the characteristic or the response that's measured to see if the manipulated work, manipulation works. So in this case, strength, did the participants who took vitamin D gets stronger, that's the dependent variable. So 
there are also extraneous variables that we have to keep in mind. And these are variables or characteristics that could interfere with the outcome of the study. For example, you could find out that two of your participants joined a gym and have been working out on the side in addition to the study. That could help them to get stronger. There are also confounding variables. And this is a type of extraneous variable that changes in sync with the independent variable. So it's changing at the same time as the independent variable. And this makes it really hard to figure out which was the cause to the, to the dependent variable. For example, um, you take the vitamin D pill at the same time every day. Um, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing, not changing anything in the routine as much as possible. Um, there is a way to control issues with, with extraneous variables, and that is through controlling the variables. So holding the variables constant fixes this. So making sure that everything, the the, taking the pill at the same time every day, exercise is consistent, and making sure, so you might have to make sure that you see them take the pill. Um, you might have to make sure that you are able to somehow make sure that they are exercising at the same time and that it's consistent with the research and this is not changing at all and that no routine change um, is occurring for them. So that's um, confounding variables. Another thing to know about is the double blind study. Um, the researchers and the participants don't know what treatment the part participants are getting. So this makes the study even stronger. And this is important for controlling for the placebo effect. A placebo effect is when you think that a change is happening even though you're taking a sugar pill, that you're, you know, you're getting uh, stronger or getting better, and so you have a belief in that. Um, and this is because um, thinking is a belie believing in a lot of cases. Some people will feel results or do better because they believe the pill they're taking should work. So by having the researcher not know which pill they're taking and having the participants in the study not knowing if they're getting the placebo or the vitamin D, that double blind aspect of it helps to control for biases or for a person believing that, they're, um, that they are um, getting stronger because of the pill that they're taking. There's also experimenter bias that we need to really take a look at. And this is a researcher's expectation. And this can influence the outcome of a study. In addition to placebo effects, the experimenter bias can be controlled for with a double blind study. So just like what we talked about before. Um, so the experimenter bias is something that we really need to keep in mind for studies. Um, and of course, um, it's not always possible, but when it is a double blind study can, can very much help with that. So we've talked a lot about research um, and the different kinds of research and what's involved in research. And um, so I want to now talk about something that's very important, um, and that is ethics. The reason that we want to talk about this is because um, we didn't always have um, ethical standards that were needed, that we adhered to and we do have them now. Um, so it's really talking about um, how, how we study. How do we make sure that what we are doing is not messing people up? Um, we have some things in place. We have IRBs now, internal review boards. Um, we have all kinds of, um, uh, we have our peers that are reviewing uh, our work and checking the data, these sorts of things that are making sure that are the standards of what we are doing are high and that they, we aren't having any iatrogenic effects that what we're doing is um, not going to harm anyone. So an example of um, a study that was done that was um, not ethical were the syphilis studies of the 20s and 1920s and 1930s. 
Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about these. Um, and you may have already learned about them, but I will uh, show a quick, quick video about it. But another thing that we need to really keep in mind is confidentiality. So keeping participant and ther therapy client information protected and confidential. So um, researchers don't talk about their participants. Therapists don't talk about their patients, period. End of story. Their notes are kept up in locked cabinets and information is not shared in insecure ways. Participants in studies have their names kept from paperwork and are assigned numbers so their information is kept confidential so that if you found the papers, you would have a number with it. There would be no name on it, no identifying information. Those names would be kept in a separate area so that you wouldn't be able to um, get that information. Um, and there's also informed consent and debriefing. And this is important because it used to be that people could uh, be put into studies and not even know they were in a study. They could sort of be tricked into participating. So now an informed consent um, with easy to understand language, large font, and in the language that a person knows well is used. There's also something called debriefing. And um, this is where we tell a person about the study that they were in and talk about it with them. And this is particularly for those who are in studies where deception is used. So deception is still okay to be used, but um, debriefing is used and, um, and a consent is used and all of that. So the study that I wanted to talk to you about um, the syphilis study was the Tuskegee, Tuskegee syphilis study. And this was in the 20s and 30s. And this was done by the United States government. And um, this was considered to be okay at the time. And this really raised some red flags and this is not done in this way at all. And uh, we were able to see just how damaging this kind of research could be and the effects it could have. And this wasn't the only unethical study that was conducted, but it's such an egregious study that it's um, really important to see and to not forget that this was done so that we make sure that we never do that again. So I'm gonna share my screen with you and show you the um, Tuskegee syphilis study. Um, let me just get to the share screen real quick. Okay, I believe I'm sharing the screen now. Okay, so um, the link that um, I'm showing you has, uh, it's from the Associated Press. Um, this, if you Google it, it's widely talked about um, and it, there are videos um, and a lot of, uh, a lot of press on, uh, that has been done on this. This particular one was done in 1997, so it was a while ago. I'm just looking for the video on here to see if I can find it. Um, this might be just an article here. Let me see. Hold on. Hmm. Well, hopefully this, is this it? Nope. All right. I thought that this had the Tuskegee, um, I'll just keep going down and see. No, nope, it doesn't. Okay. Well, my apologies for that one. Let me see if I can pull up, um, another another link for you. Here we go. This one, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, put in your, um, in your folder that you have for this lecture, this link um, so that you know the name of it, that it's the Tuskegee syphilis study and you'll be able to watch a video on it. I'll also put this link in there because it does talk about um, it's a, it's a written article about the Tuskegee syphilis study. So um, we, and then there's, I'll also include in there this little blurb here about, that was from the History Channel about it. But I do have another video to show you, and this is unethical psychology experiments video that I'd like for you to see. 
Curious Lloyd. Psychology as we know it is a relatively young science, but since its inception, it has helped us gain a greater understanding of ourselves and our interactions with the world. Many psychological experiments have been valid and ethical, allowing researchers to make new treatments and therapies available, and giving other insights into our motivations and actions. Sadly, others have ended up backfiring horribly, ruining lives and shaming the profession. Here are 10 psychological experiments that spiraled out of control. The Stanford Prison Experiment. In 1971, social psychologist Philip Zimbardo set out to interrogate the ways in which people conform to social roles, using a group of male college students to take part in a two week long experiment in which they would live as prisoners and guards in the mock prison. However, having selected his test subjects, Zimbardo assigned them their roles without their knowledge, unexpectedly arresting the prisoners outside their own homes. The results were disturbing. Ordinary college students turned into viciously sadistic guards and spineless and increasingly distraught prisoners, becoming deeply enmeshed with their roles they were playing. After just six days, the distressing reality of this prison forced Zimbardo to prematurely end the experiment. The Monster Study In this study, conducted in 1939, 22 orphan children 10 with stutters, were separated equally into two groups. One with a speech therapist who conducted positive therapy by praising the children's progress and fluency of speech. The other with a speech therapist who openly chastised the children for the slightest mistake. The results showed that children who have received negative responses were badly affected in terms of their psychological health. Yet more bad news was to come as it was later revealed that some of the children who had previously developed speech problems following the experiment. In 2007, six of the orphan children were awarded $920,000 in compensation for emotional damage that the six-month study had left them with. The MK Ultra. The CIA performed many unethical experiments into mind control and psychology under the banner of Project MK Ultra during the 50s and 60s. Theodore Kachunsky, otherwise known as the Unabomber, is reported to have been a test subject in the CIA's disturbing experiments, which may have contributed to his mental instability. In another case, the administration of LSD to the US Army biological weapons expert, Frank Olson, is thought to have sparked a crisis of conscience, <coughs> inspiring him to tell the world about his research. Instead, Olson is said to have committed suicide, jumping from a 13-story hotel room window. Although there is strong evidence that he was murdered, this doesn't even touch on the long-term psychological damage other test subjects are likely to have suffered. Elephant on LSD In 1962, Warren Thomas, the director of Lincoln Park Zoo in Oklahoma City, injected an elephant named Tusco with 3,000 times the typical human dose of LSD. It was an attempt to make his mark on the scientific community by determining whether the drug could induce the aggressiveness and high hormone levels that male elephants experience periodically. The only contribution Thomas made was to create a public relations disaster, as Tusco died almost immediately after collapsing and going into convulsions. The Milgram Experiment In 1963, in the wake of the atrocities of the Holocaust, Stanley Milgram set out to test the hypnosis that there was something special about the German people that had allowed them to participate in genocide under the pretense of an experiment into human learning. Milgram asked normal members of the public to ask questions to a man attached to an electric shock generator and shook him in increasing measure when he answered incorrectly. The man was an actor. The shocks were fake, but the participants didn't know this. The terrifying part where people overwhelmingly obeyed the commands of the experimenter. Even when the man screamed in apparent agony and begged for mercy, does that mean we all have a little evil in all of us, perhaps? Tony Lamadrade. 
Many medicated schizophrenics enrolled in a University of California study that required them to stop taking their medication in a program that started in 1983. The study was meant to give information that would allow doctors to better treat schizophrenia, but rather it messed up the lives of many test subjects, 90% of whom relapsed into episodes of mental illness. One participant, Tony Lamadrade, leaped to his death from a rooftop six years after first enrolling into the study. The Pit of Despair Psychologist Harry Harlow was obsessed with the concept of love, but rather than writing poems or love songs, he performed sick, twisted experiments on monkeys during the 1970s. One of his experiments revolved around confining the monkeys in total isolation in an apparatus he called Well of Despair a featureless empty chamber depriving the animal of any stimulus or socialization which resulted in his subjects going insane and even starving themselves to death in two cases. Harlow ignored the criticism of his colleagues and is quoted as saying, how could you love monkeys? The last laugh was on him. However, as his horrific treatment of his subjects is acknowledged as being a driving force behind the development of the animal rights movement and the end of such cruel experiments. The third wave. Running along a similar theme to the Milgram experiment, the third wave carried out in 1967 was an experiment that set out to explore the ways in which democratic societies can be infiltrated by the apparel of fascism. Using a class of high school students, the experimenter created a system whereby some students were considered members of a prestigious order. The students showed increased motivation to learn, yet, more worryingly, became eager to get on board with evil-minded practices, such as excluding non-members from the class. Even more scarily, this behavior was gleefully continued outside of the classroom. After just four days, the experiment was considered to be slipping out of control and was ceased. Homosexual aversion therapy. In the 1960s, homosexuality was frequently depicted as a mental illness, with many individuals seeking voluntary or otherwise a way to cure themselves of their sexual attraction to members of the same sex. Experimental therapies at the time included aversion therapies, where homosexual images were paired with such things as electric shocks and injections that caused vomiting. The thought was that the patient would associate pain with homosexuality rather than curing homosexuality. These experiments profoundly psychologically damaged the patients, with at least one man dying from the treatment he received after he went into a coma. David Raymer in 1966, when David Raymer was eight months old, his circumcision was botched and he lost his penis due to burns. Psychologist John Money suggested that baby David be given a sex change. The parents agreed, but what they didn't know was that Money secretly wanted to use David as part of an experiment to prove his views that gender identity was not inborn, but rather determined by nature and upbringing. David was renamed Brenda, surgically altered to have a vagina and given hormonal supplements. But tragically, this experiment backfired. Brenda acted like a stereotypical boy throughout childhood, and the Raymer family began to fall apart. At 14, Brenda was told the truth and decided to go back to being David. He committed suicide at the age of 38. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and possibly subscribe, and I will see you Sunday with another video. Okay, so, there we saw a lot of examples of unethical research and how it was conducted. And thankfully, there have been changes made that really add a lot of rigor to um, the research that we do now. And, and there's a policy in place that makes sure that other people are checking to make sure that a study that we design that we may say, hey, this is a great idea, somebody would stop and say, hey, that's not. Um, so an IRB is one instance of that, and so institutions uh, that have research uh, involved in them all have IRBs now um, in place and peer-reviewed um, uh, journals and those sorts of things. All of these things keep us from uh, conducting unethical research. So this is it for this um, topic today. Just make sure to submit your journal article and I will put the Tuskegee link in um, 
your folder. And so please check that out if you um, are interested. And I'll see you next time.